All right, well, today we will continue in our series entitled The Mother of All Wars. And um, as you know, we're about uh, study number five or six today. Last week we did a, a revision. I was by the campsite. I understand that the broadcast was a little shaky. And also, regrettably, I, I forgot completely to, to press the record button. So I don't have a recording of this. And I think I need to really uh, archive those thoughts that I shared last week. So I'm going to take about a half of our time today, maybe about a, a third of our time, and go back over that revision that we did last week. I know it just won't be as effective because I had children teaching last week. And when I'm teaching children, everything comes out much more clearly for some reason. So, I mean, breaking it down to their level is always something I enjoy doing. And um, it's not going to be the same with just dealing with adults. But anyway, hopefully it will be a blessing. And um, for those of you who don't know, this series of studies is on our YouTube channel, the one under my name. There's, there's a channel entitled Open Face where I, I archive the, the webinars that we have each week. And um, those that we do here on this platform, they're in a channel named David Clayton. And if you go to the playlists, you'll see there's a playlist dealing with the book of Revelation. And there's a playlist entitled The Mother of All Wars. So the, 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 the messages we have been having on this topic, they will be under that playlist. I know some people don't know how to use a playlist in YouTube, but if you go look for playlists, you'll find different playlists where you can find a series of, of, of sermons under particular headings. So anyway, this, this series will be on the, the mother of all wars. Now, I'm going to start, as I said, with re revising the main points we have looked at over the last five or six weeks. And, you know, somebody might be, be questioning, what is the relevance of these topic, these, these studies? Well, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm, res I'm, I'm the person responsible for directing our minds in this direction. And I'll tell you, I have been so blessed. When I say blessed, I mean my, my understanding of God has been greatly enhanced. My understanding of the plan of salvation, my understanding of, of what is going on in the, un in the universe has been greatly enhanced by the, the ideas I'm trying to share. This is why I think it is important I believe that the greatest problem in the world, not just in Christendom, but in the world, the greatest problem is ignorance of God. Ignorance of God. That's the problem of the universe. People don't serve God because they don't know God. They have bad ideas about God. Christians are, are, are into all kinds of false teachings and their, their worship and their witness is perverted because they don't know God. If anybody asks me what is the greatest contribution I believe that I can make to Christianity, if you if you ask me what do I believe is is what is the greatest thing God has, has has helped me to do, and I would say it has been that He has helped me to give people a better understanding of the kind of person God is. That's my contribution. I talk to God about these things because. The questions go through my mind. Sometimes I say, I'm not a great healer. I'm not a great evangelist. I'm not a great apostle. And I go through the list and I say, what is my contribution to Christianity? I can look around and I can see what Moses did, what Elijah did. And I say, what is my contribution? And this I know. This has blessed me most of all. I think I've been able to get an understanding of God and his ways that can make a difference in the lives of people, in the way people relate to God. So I'm just saying that because I want us to understand why I think this is so important. So I'm going to go to my, um, my PowerPoint screen. And I'm going to, first of all, do a little revision of what we looked at over the past five weeks or so excluding last week because last week i was at the campsite but yes last week because we did um have a revision last week so 
first of all, the first point we looked at was, or the first, I, I, I have about four things that I consider to be vital foundational truths. Now, these four things are five things that I have here. I think about four things. They are ideas that are not properly understood by Christians in general. And because of these, this lack of understanding, it, a foundation is laid for a great deal of misunderstanding. So I want us to understand these four points and to get them firmly embedded in our minds. They are foundations upon which all truth is built. All truth is built upon this. And if, if we understand these things, all the questions that atheists like to ask and unbelievers and skeptics and agnostics, the questions they like to ask, are answered in a logical and reasonable way when we understand these foundational truths. So the first thing I want to understand is the nature of goodness. And by this, I mean, what is goodness? What is it made up of? What does it consist of? The nature of goodness. First of all, the first great truth, God alone is good. And I know that if I were to present this view and in isolation, people would ridicule me. But then it is Jesus who said this, right? Because Jesus said it, it is unimpeachable. Nobody is good except God. And this teaches us something about good. This, this, this truth is, is, is linked to the truth that good exists only where God dwells. If God alone is good, is it possible to have good without God? No, it's not possible. You know, some people say, I have seen goodness in, in people who are not Christians. And so they come to one or two conclusions. They either say, God does not dwell only with Christians. He dwells with unbelievers too, because I've seen good in unbelievers. They use that argument. But there's another possibility it may be that what they think is good is not really good. Mute everybody. It's something else disguised as good. You, you know, we, we can mistake, because we have limited vision, we mistake sometimes morality for goodness. Here, here, is, here is a fact. Everybody loves himself. And everybody loves what is an extension of me. I'm not sure that this is really goodness. Because Jesus says even the heathen do the same. The, the, the heathen thank those who, uh, the heathen do good to those who are their friends and who are their relatives. But he says the kind of, of good that loves your enemies is the good that comes. It, it, it's a special kind of good that God wants to see in his children. So when you see a mother loving her child, that is what we call maternal instinct. Uh, 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 a crocodile does the same. A crocodile will kill you if you go near its eggs. That is not necessarily goodness. That, that's, that's a genetic instinct that is, is built into you. Goodness comes from conscious decisions to be selfless. And true selflessness exists only in God. And so anywhere you find true good, it is only where God lives. If it, this one truth alone takes care of all the theological confusion, you know that you cannot find good by doing good. You know that you cannot find good by studying how to be good. If good is exclusively related to where God is, if good is exclusively related to God, because God alone is good, then you know you instantly you have righteousness by faith because you understand if you want good, you have to seek God right away. All the foolishness that people have, 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 have become steeped in where they think that doing good, righteousness is right doing, all of this nonsense, it goes away when we understand this simple truth. And that is tied to the, 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 the other thing that our moral state, our moral condition, whether we are good or evil, depends on our relationship to God. This is 
Christianity 101. Nobody can claim to be good if he does not have a relationship with God where God is living in him, where God is dwelling with him. Nobody can claim to be good. They can claim, but it's a false claim. This is how you define good and evil. First foundational truth. All right, the next thing is, the next foundation is free choice. Free choice is given to all. And uh, by this, I mean all intelligent beings. Okay, this is a fundamental thing that, that God, it is, it is an inviolable principle in God's universe. God will not rule in a universe of slaves. He will not rule in a universe of robots because ruling robots is pointless. Ruling slaves is for, for, for perverts. God wants a universe of happy people and freedom is connected to happiness. Worship and love are, are, are meaningless if a person does not have a choice. So it is, it is an inviolable truth that free choice is given to everybody in God's universe. This is a foundation again, the second foundation for understanding everything that is happening. It's connected to the reality that free choice is what allowed sin to arise. Without free choice, there could have been no sin. So the gift that allows happiness is also the gift that allowed evil. I'm willing to say, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe somebody might say, I am presumptuous, say, presumptuous to say what I'm about to say, but I'm about to say that even God could not have designed it otherwise. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say that, okay. But God designed it this way, that you cannot have freedom without having the possibility of sin. You cannot have freedom without the possibility of somebody going the other direction. Do you see what I'm saying? If, the, if a person cannot take the other direction, there's no freedom. What you are is a robot. What you are is, is, is a machine. Fundamental to the idea of freedom is the ability to go in the other direction. So free choice allowed sin to arise. And the other point that goes with, with it is that this is what allowed man to separate from God, okay? So we see there's a connection between, we see, let me go back here. We see that there's a connection here between sin arising and separation from God. All right, those things are connected. Free choice is what allowed this to happen. And um, while it is something, th th this, this, is, this is, all of this helps us to understand those hard questions that people ask. Why did God allow sin? Where did Satan come from? Once you understand these fundamentals, you know, these, these questions that um, unbelievers like to ask, they're answered. The third thing that we looked at was the identity, was, was corporate identity. This is, an, this, this is another fundamental principle, corporate identity. And what this means is that all mankind, what this, what this leads us to the conclusion that all mankind shares the same corporate identity. All of us are a part of the identity called Adam's, Adam's progeny, Adam's descendants. We all belong to Adam. And the consequence of this is that we all inherit Adam's legacy. This is foundational to understanding how can a person be born a sinner? We, we inherit Adam's legacy, and, and, and legacy is what a person leaves behind after he's gone. Adam separated himself from God, and this became our inheritance because we share the same corporate identity. I'm not going back through that because we spent some time doing that the other day. The fourth thing is that we, we try to understand the nature of the curse that came upon humanity. What we inherited from Adam was the curse of separation from God. That's the nature of the curse. It's important that we understand this because some people think that the curse is that, you know, we, 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 we are disobedient 
or that we, we began to die, or that we became stunted in our growth. But the real curse, the, 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 the fundamental nature of the curse is that it was separation from God. And how do we know this? We know because Jesus took the curse. And Jesus, what happened when Jesus took the curse? He was hung on a tree and separated from God. Let me show you where Paul makes this point. Let me show you where Paul makes this point in, in, um, in Galatians chapter 3. Paul says, it says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Christ was made a curse for us. Where and when? For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The curse came upon Christ when he was hanging on the tree. Why am I emphasizing this? Because there are people who believe that Christ was cursed from the day he was born. If this is true, it means that we are cursed by having human nature. It's not human nature that curses us. Christ, Christ was not cursed because he took human nature. Christ was cursed when he hung on the tree. That's what Peter said. It says, Peter says he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. It was on the tree that he bore the curse. And so you have to look at the cross to understand what was the curse. The curse was that he was separated from God. It was the only place that Jesus was separated from God. So I'm saying this to emphasize the point that the curse is, the curse that we inherited was separation from God. That is the curse. That's a fundamental truth. It's connected to the next truth that this separation should have been absolute. Okay. So when I say absolute, what I mean is that what Adam brought upon humanity was to have been permanent. It, would have, it was to have been complete. Last week, I asked the children to define this word absolute, and they gave me the idea of com complete and permanent. That's what it should have been. Why were we not completely, permanently cut off from God? Why? It's because instantly there was the promise of a savior and so because of this the curse was modified you know as i as i've, as I've emphasized i've heard people say that adam started to die that day and that when god says in the day that you eat you shall die god meant that it would take a thousand years that's an interesting little interpretation but I don't believe so. I believe that when God says, in the day you eat, you shall die. What did Adam expect? What did Eve expect? Eve did not know anything about that day being a thousand years. Adam expected that that day he would drop dead. And so did Eve. And that is what God meant. God meant, if you separate from me, you cannot live. Because that's what happened to Christ. When Christ was separated from God, he could not live. He died the same day. That's what should have happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. But instantly, the curse was modified because Jesus stepped in and said, I will become the substitute. So what does this mean? The substitute has to take that curse upon himself. He has to do this. Otherwise, the substitute is null and void. It doesn't make any sense. So... The next point, and this is related to number four. I hardly want to look at it as a, as a separate point. The point is the, the power of the curse. What was the real power of this curse? The curse is separation from God, but why does that have such a power? Because in order to break the curse, you have to come under the power of the curse, okay? I took some time to explain why it has to be. Somebody, somebody who is not bearing the curse cannot, cannot break the curse. You can't break it unless you, 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 are, you are connected to it, you are tied up with it. Then you can try to break it. The power of the curse is, as we just saw, is separation from God. And the power of the curse is not just partial separation. 
It is complete separation. This is the power of the curse. That's why the curse is so powerful, because we see, we see that when a person is separated from God, to break the curse, you must choose God in that condition. You are separated from God and you choose God. That's how you break the curse of separation from God. God cannot come to you because it was man who made the choice. We have chosen to step away from God. God will not invade our choice. We must choose to go back to God. Somebody must stand up as a human being and say, I must go back to God. But how can you go back to God when you are separated from God? Separated from God, nobody can choose what is good. You cannot choose God because you cannot choose good. Without God, you cannot choose good because God alone is good. Everything is fitting together perfectly. And man is in a condition where he's hopeless. There's no hope for humanity. Satan has his race of rebels against God. And there is no hope for us. You look at the dilemma and it's impossible. The first time I saw this, my mind was blown. I was, I was, I was getting goosebumps. My hair was standing up on my head when I was understanding where we were and how Satan felt like he had his he, he had God by the throat, as it were. And he felt that no way could humanity ever get out of this. He had his race of rebels. And I marveled when I saw the greatness and the wisdom, the magnificence of the plan that our God put together. I was blown away. I really, I really appreciate this understanding so much. And I, I'm so thankful to the Father for, for helping me to see this. So. This is the wonderful part now, the qualifications of the curse breaker. What do you have to be in order to break the curse? Because a man cannot break it. And these, these are the points that were emphasized. He must be a God being. Only a God being can break the curse. Why? Because only somebody who is good can be separated from God and still be good. Only somebody who is God by nature, can be separated from God and still be good. Magnificent, amazing, astonishing. There you see, I read, I read where people said Jesus had to be divine because only a divine sacrifice could pay the price for breaking the law. It was all about legalism. This is a fundamental reason. It's not about a legal reason why the law demands divinity. That never made any sense to me. I couldn't reason it out. I couldn't fathom it. I, I heard the statement and I accepted the statement, but I could not understand it. It did not make sense. It was not something I could give to a person and expect him to understand the mechanics of it. But when you understand the curse, it makes perfect sense. He must be a God being. He must be inherently good because only God could be separated from God and still be good and still choose God. How could, the, how could Satan have fathomed the wisdom of God? How could he have fathomed when he came with his little puny plan to try to overthrow God's government and destroy humanity? How could his little puny mind have understood the infinite wisdom of the great God? Wow. If I get heated, it's, 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 it's the way it turns me on. Secondly, amazingly, he must be a human being. He must be a limited human being, a human under the curse. If he was God in God's power, he could never be under the curse because God in the power of God has almighty power. He can do anything. He can't be separated from God. But he had to be a human being. He had to be God in the form of a human being. Perfect. Without the power of God, but with the nature of God. So he could be made into a human being and put under this curse where he's separated from God. My goodness. Do you see why before you could come here, God had to take you by, by the road of helping you under, understand the truth about the, the Godhead? If you believe in the Trinity, you could never even dream. 
to begin to understand this amazing plan. How could you? You have to know that Jesus was the son of God, the true begotten son of God, so he could be divine. And yet the son of God, so God could take away his powers from him. He, wa he was given these powers as a son of God because he's not God almighty. Everything makes perfect sense when you understand the truth about the Godhead. This is where God wanted to take us when he made us understand the truth about God. That was the beginning. And as you begin to look at the mechanics of where this truth takes us, it is mind blowing. You know, we talk about the science of salvation. There is nothing, when, when I think of the, the, the marvels of, of science, and I think of the marvels of, that we talk about in the world, one of the things that I really find myself very fascinated about is, is DNA. Complex, magnificent, amazing. And when I think of the plan of salvation that we are looking at here now, the thing that comes to my mind is DNA. Complex, but perfectly put together, beautifully organized. A, a, a science, there's a science in this that is mind blowing. When you look at how the whole thing comes together in such a perfect way, it is amazing. So he had to be a human being under the curse and he had to be a God being good in himself. The only person who could meet this condition in all the universe, search high and search low, every corner, one corner to another, nobody could qualify but the only begotten Son of God. Astonishing and amazing. Only the Son of God was good in himself and yet could be made into a man. God the Father is good in himself, but God the Father cannot be made into a man. God the Father is, 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 is the one who upholds the universe. God the Father is God. God cannot be less than God. It had to be the Son of God. So that is where we, 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 we arrived at so far. And today I want us to move on now to the next part of our study, which I want to entitle The Curse of the Law. Now we are looking at the mother of all wars and the law plays a part because the law is a major thing in the Bible. It's a major, it's a major event in the history of salvation. So we have to pause with the law and see what is the purpose of the law. How did it come into the picture? Because we already saw that the real problem was separation from God, right? The problem is separation from God. How did the law come into the picture? That's what we want to look at today. Now, the verse we read a little earlier on says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hung it on a tree. We just looked at that verse. But I want to highlight here now where Paul refers to what happened Paul refers to it as the curse of the law. Remember earlier on, I said that the curse is that we are separated from God. But Paul brings something else into the picture and he talks about the curse of the law. And this has confused a lot of people. So we're going to look at this issue of the curse of the law. And um, how does this tie in to the entire story of what is happening now in romans 5 and verse 12 we see that the original curse i want us to look at the original curse because now there are there are two curses let me put it that way there are two curses there is the curse of adam and there's the curse of the law paul mentions a second curse he calls it the curse of the law the first curse is this romans 5 and verse 12 by one man, sin entered into the world, and the death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That's the first curse. All men die, all men are separated from God, all men are born sinners because of Adam. That's the first curse. If you look at verses 18 and 19 of the same chapter, Romans 5, here's what it says. 
Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. I'm just reading the first part. The other part says that righteousness comes upon everybody by one man. But I'm showing you the first part where it says that this offense came upon all men because of one man's offense. The curse, the original curse is because of one man. It's not because of you breaking the law or me breaking the law. It's because of one man. That's the point I'm making. If you look at verse 19, it says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. That is cur the original curse. We became sinners because of one man. That's the original curse, and that's the point I want to emphasize. So if you, if you, if you, you will understand that the original problem was a broken relationship. This is the original curse. We lost our trust in God, and because we stopped trusting God, the relationship was broken. We went east and God, we went west and God was east. So that is the origin, original problem. The original problem is not you lying and stealing and killing and fornication. The original problem is that you are in a different zone from where God is. So it was a broken relationship. But now there's a second problem created, which is called the curse of the law. And I want to show you what the Bible says about the second problem. Look at what Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 20. Paul says, moreover, the law entered. Notice the word entered. What does it mean? It means that the law came into the picture. The law came into the formula. We already had a situation where Adam turned us into sinners. But the law entered, the law comes into the picture. The law steps in now. Why? Why? It says that the offense might abound. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. What is he saying? If you go back to verse, look in the right panel in verse, verse 18 and 19. It says, look at what he says in verse 18. By the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. By the what? By the offense. Look at what Paul says a little later on in verse 20 now. Why did the law come into the picture? The law entered the picture. Why? That the, the same offense, the offense, this offense that you see over here that Adam brought, this offense might abound or become greater. I hope everybody is understanding what I'm saying. The scripture is telling us that the, 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 the law came into the picture to make Adam's problem become greater. And that is something that does not seem to make sense. We already have a problem. Why does God give us a, a law to make the problem greater? But let me illustrate that first before I explain it. All right. You look and you see that. Um, now we have a second problem. We have an additional curse. We have the curse of a broken law. Man is breaking the law. And so there's a second curse that comes upon him. And let me explain what the Bible says that this second curse is. It's a broken law, yes. But look at what, how the Bible explains this broken law. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Look at what it says. Cursed be he. There's the curse. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. There you see clearly that the Bible says that the person who does not, con does not confirm to do all the words of this law was to be cursed. So this is a second curse that comes upon people. The first curse was Adam's. Adam's sin, Adam's transgression, Adam's offense. Now there's a second curse if you don't obey the law. And everybody knows that nobody, nobody, no human being apart from one has ever kept the law to do all that is said in the law. But there's a curse if you don't do it. If you look at what James says, James 2 and verse 10, look at what James says. Whosoever shall keep the whole law 
and yet offending one point, he is guilty of all. So I wish all those who think that their law keeping will qualify them for salvation. I wish you luck because you will need a lot of it. It won't suffice because to be to be to, to offend in one point means you have failed. You have come under the curse of the law. Now the question is, who created the second problem? Well, if you look at it, it's God who, who created the second problem. Who gave the law? It was God. And Paul tells you that the law entered. God gave the law so that the offense might become greater. So the question is, why did God create a second problem? Let me explain something to you that I think maybe most of the most of the men will be able to understand, probably the women. But I think the men can empathize with this better because men, men, we men tend to be perverse. We have some bad ways, and the women will understand we do. But I'll tell you something. Men have a, most men, as you grow older, you have a problem. All right? Well, yeah, most men. They develop a problem called prostatitis. It's kind of like a delicate subject, so men don't like to talk about it. But as you grow older, you tend to start to have an enlarged prostate, and you find that urinating becomes a little more difficult. And um, usually they will say that men are to go and get a, 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 a test every year. That's what they say. I will tell you, I've never gotten one of those tests. And um, most men will never do it. Why? Because it's a very embarrassing test where the doctor has to insert his finger up in a delicate part of your body. And men just don't want anybody interfering around that part. So most men will never go and get tested. And they'll kind of just live with prostatitis and it will. But what if it develops into cancer? Usually by the time you have cancer now, you are ready to go to the doctor. You are willing to go to the doctor. So you have one problem, but then you have the, the problem is not so severe, so you kind of ignore it, or you're not aware of the severity of it, so you ignore it. I know that after this sermon, my wife is going to get on my case to go and get the imam tested, but I'm very stubborn when it comes to that. I hate doctors and that kind of thing. So I'm going to pray about it and just leave it to the Lord. Anyway, I still use some natural remedies. But um, anyway, they, they, there comes a second problem. And the second problem is so severe and so obvious that you have to do something about it. This is what God did when he gave the law. We had a problem. How many people knew there was a problem? Look here. I, I, it was when I was about, it was when I was 55 years old. I think I was about 55. When I understood about my first problem, I never knew I had a problem because of Adam. I grew up as a Christian in the Christian faith. I never knew that Adam was the source of my problem. You know, I always thought my problem was my disobedience. I always thought it was breaking the law. I never knew I inherited this problem from Adam. Most people never know about that first problem. And because they don't think they have a problem, they don't seek a remedy. But there comes a day, the second problem, the law breaking over and over and over, and you can't do better. That second problem shows you that you have a great problem and you turn to Christ. And one, pro one solution solves both problems. That was God's plan. Let me go back to my screen because I have some illustrations that I want to share with you. So you had this additional curse that came upon people. What the law did was that the law legalized the problem. All right, that's, I like to put it that way. The law legalized the problem. And I'm going to explain this. There's an illustration I have used. There's an illustration I've used, and you're going to be familiar with this illustration, but I'm going back to it because I think it's, it, it, it helps to illustrate what I'm trying to say very well. All right, the law legalizes the problem. And um, here's my illustration. I'm going to try to explain 
how the problem became a legal problem. And I'm going to use this illustration of a, a group of people who are marooned on the top of a plateau. Now, let us suppose that, you know, these are primitive people. There's no way to get off this plateau, this mountain top. They are marooned on the top. I'm not, we don't know how they got there, but they are there and they can't get off. They're kind of making a living subsisting on the top of this plateau and they are living there, but there's no way down. It's a sheer drop of a few miles down and you can't see what is at the bottom because it is, there are clouds around the base of this plateau and you can't see what is be below. So everybody's up on top of this, this place and they're just kind of surviving. And one day, a strange person appears. I hope you can see who was added to the picture, all right? A strange person appears. Nobody knows how he got there. He's a very interesting gentleman and he starts talking to the people and he tells them that there is something wonderful down below. That if they jump from this hill, they will drop like a stone. But as soon as they pass through the clouds, they will start to float and they will land as gently as a feather and they will land in a place that is paradise. It will be, it's wonderful. They have all kinds of amazing fruit and wonderful things down there. All they have to do is jump. And this man, all that he does, he jumps off himself. He jumps off. And he reappears. And when he reappears, his hands, his hands are full of amazing fruit, good things. And he says, see, this is what I found down at the bottom. And he's so persuasive. And of course, this man represents the serpent and what happened in the, in the garden. That's what the serpent said to Eve. He says, if you jump off this cliff, if you step away from what God says you should do, there's no danger at all. God says that there is a there is disaster waiting at the bottom, but there's no danger at all. Look, I'm eating the fruit. If you eat this, you will enter paradise. God is lying to you. And so, like Eve listened to the serpent, people start listening to this man and they start jumping off this mountain, stepping off the cliff. And you know what happens? As soon as they step off, they fall like a stone. They go through the clouds and they are smashed to pieces at the bottom but nobody knows because they are not coming back and everybody is thinking that they are going to paradise so they, are, they keep stepping up that is how it was with eve she stepped off the precipice she dis, she did not believe god she believed the serpent now god is like th this was a natural problem where people were killed by nature Adam brought this upon humanity and we're all stepping off this cliff and we're all dying. And it's a nature problem. We are being killed by nature. We don't realize that we have a problem or that there is a problem. So what happens is that a second man appears. And this second man uh, represents the law. The second man appears and he, 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 he tells the people that if they jump, he's going to shoot them. Now, he's threatening to kill these people. And what happens is that somebody jumps, and as soon as he jumps, the man shoots him dead. Now, this, this, this is, I'm trying to help us to understand one of the reasons why God gave the law. It's to create a second problem, but also to legalize the problem. Now, remember, at this point, what is killing the people? It's nature that is killing us. We are dying because we, 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 we experience Adam's heritage. We inherited what Adam gave us, and so we are dying. God gave us the law, and now why are we dying? We are dying because we break the law. You jump from the cliff, and you get shot. You break the law, and you are stoned to death, or you are, you are hung, or you are punished in some way. You are being punished for breaking the law. The real problem is this problem. This is the real problem. We have, we have a, a, a lie that has infected us. We have a disease in our system and we are stepping from the pre, from over the precipice. But God now legalizes the problem. And God says, if you jump, I will shoot you. If you break the law, you'll be sentenced to die. Why? 
because he wanted to be afraid of jumping. He wanted to be afraid of sin. This is what we should be afraid of. But what are we afraid of now? We're afraid of the man with the gun. We're afraid of God. He has turned the natural problem into a legal problem. He has given us 10 commandments and said, if you break these, you will die. It's a second problem. And the reason for this second problem is to make us understand that there is a problem because we never understood it when we were jumping from the precipice. When we had sin in our nature, we never knew we had a problem. The law had to be put in place to make us understand that we do have a problem. Now we have a legal problem. We have a law problem, whereas before we had a nature problem. If there's anybody who does not understand what I'm saying, I would like to hear you question, your question at the end, all right? I hope we can understand this. Now, the nature problem becomes a legal problem. And so that is where the law came into the picture. The law legalized the problem. And it, 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 the Bible tells us in Romans 4 and verse 15, it says, because the law worketh wrath. I wonder if anybody at the beginning understood that this is what the law does. The law worketh wrath. And, and what this means is that the law creates condemnation. The law creates condemnation. When the Bible says the law worketh, it means that it creates something. It works to do something. What it works to do is to create condemnation. Because where no law is, there is no transgression. Where there is no law, you cannot be guilty. So when Adam brought sin upon us, we were not guilty. We were not dying because we were guilty. We were dying because death was in our experience, not because we were guilty. We were dying because we inherited death. We were, we were, we were separated from God because we inherited sin. That is what we got from Adam. But the law came now and it created transgression. It made us guilty. So we are not only sinners, we now become guilty sinners. Two problems. As it says in James 2 and verse 10, anybody who keeps the whole law and offends in one point, he is guilty. The law created guilt. At first, only Adam was guilty. But now all of us are guilty because Adam broke his law and we break the 10. So we're all guilty. And so God says, the Lord, the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That's what God gave the law for, to create guilt and to increase the condemnation. So the law legalized the problem. And the second thing the law did was it created an awareness of sin. Let's go back to the Bible and see where that comes out. In Romans 7 and verse 7, look at what Paul said. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin but by the law. Why does he ask is the law sin? Because remember what we, we just read. We said that the law creates guilt. The law makes you guilty. You were already a sinner and the law causes you to be a guilty sinner. The law creates guilt. So Paul says, no, no, I would not have known sin but for the law. So the law is not sin. What does the law do then? Paul says, I would not have known lust unless the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law helps me to, to become aware of sin. I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. And I want to explain that again. When I was born a sinner in Adam, did I know myself to be a sinner? No. I knew myself to be a sinner because of the law, not because of Adam. I had sin inside of me. I was born with sin inside of me. How did I get to find out that there was sin inside of me? Because the law made me, me know. I did not know that I was covetous until the law said, thou shalt not covet. And I said, I'm not going to covet. And I found myself coveting. I said to myself, I'm not a thief. Or I didn't know I was a thief until the law said, thou shalt not steal. And I found myself stealing. Then I knew I was a thief. The law helped me to know the sin that was inside of me. That's what it means. 
It means that the law helped me to un understand my true condition. It does not mean that the law helped me to be able to define what sin is. No, it means that the law helped me to understand my true condition, to find out that there was sin dwelling inside of me. That's what it means. In Romans 7 and verse 13, it says, Sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. What is the purpose? That sin by the commandment, by the commandment, sin might become exceeding sinful. So there it is again. The commandment is intended to make sin greater so that sin becomes exceeding sinful. So God gives the commandment so that I could become a greater sinner. I was already a sinner and he gave the law to, to turn me into a greater sinner. Why? Because where sin abounds, what? Grace did much more abound. So let sin multiply. Let sin become great. That the greatness of God's grace might come into play. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how great a sinner I become. The grace that is provided is greater than all my sin. So God said, let it multiply so I can, I can become aware of my problem. That's why today, when people are turning away, from, from the concept of right and wrong. When they are bringing, what they are trying to do is legitimize wrong. That's not why God gave the law. God gave the law that people could look at themselves and say, something is wrong with me. You're a homosexual, you're a transgender. You can look at the law and say, something is wrong with me. Instead, they say, something is wrong with the law. How can you, how can you experience the great grace of God when you have not accepted the great sinful condition identified by the law that's its purpose to make you understand that sin by the commandment becomes exceeding sinful but instead the world today has rejected what god provided to show them their true condition that's why hope is being diminished for this planet because when you don't accept what god says what hope is there for you It's like, you know, my wife recently had a problem with a tooth. She had to go and get a tooth extracted. If you look at the tooth, there's nothing wrong with it. So you, you have a problem, but you, you, don't, you don't deal with the problem. Do you know what happened? She started to get a toothache. All right. Something happens and the problem becomes magnified. I mean, later on, they found that there was a a hidden cavity in there when the dentist took it out. He took an x-ray, found there's some hidden cavity, and he pulled it out. So what I, I'm using this to illustrate that you can have a problem and you don't identify it. You don't know it's there. Something comes along to create pain, and this is the law. We had a problem. We were born with it. We didn't recognize it, and God gave the law to create pain to make us become aware that something is wrong. And so when you go to fix that problem, both problems are fixed at one time because Jesus is the answer to both problems. He solved Adam's problem and he solved your problem with the law at one stroke. So the law created this awareness of sin. It increased condemnation and it created this sense of need. Romans 7 verse 9 says, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. You recognize the problem and you know that you need an answer. And you come to the place where you say, oh, wretched man that I am, Romans 7 verse 24, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And that is where I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We come to the answer. Because the law has brought us to that place. That's the purpose of the law. It's, it's, not, it's not the law that is the issue. It is a separation from God. But the law is a tool that brings me to the place where that problem can be fixed. Do we understand? The problem, the problem that law-oriented people have is that they think the law is a solution. That's the real problem. So the law legalized the problem, it created an awareness of sin, and it increased condemnation so we could seek a solution. 
So we were first of all condemned by Adam. That's the original problem. That's the first curse. Adam and Eve took the fruit and the whole race, everybody on planet Earth ends up in condemnation. We end up separated from God. And now God created a second problem. The same people condemned by Adam, now condemned by the law. That's how we properly understand what the law is about. Now, I want us to look at some of the misconceptions that people have. They have a false view of the law. They think that the law was, was, was given to provide righteousness. You even have this picture that I, 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 I used to find it very appealing. I don't find it so appealing these days because it shows Jesus pointing towards the law. It reminds me of a statement that says, the law points us to Jesus, and then Jesus points us back to the law. I don't agree with that. That is not biblical. The Bible says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. After we have come to, to Christ, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. The schoolmaster has served its purpose. It brings us to Christ. Christ does not take us back to the schoolmaster. That is not true. But that is a cliche. As it says in Galatians 3 and verse 21, is there is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. But if there had been a law given, which could have given life, righteousness would have been by the law, but the law cannot give life. And so we read where Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The law was not intended to bring righteousness. The law was not intended to produce goodness. The law was not intended to make us better people. Righteousness does not come by the law. The law was intended to make us know that we are no good. The law was intended to, to make us turn to Christ. That is its purpose. So it is something good, but it's not good if we misuse it, if we misunderstand it. It is the heart that is the problem, brothers and sisters. As it says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's what is in the heart. It's the state of our spirit. And you are born with a spirit where you are separated from God. And no matter how much you try to keep the law, if your heart is not changed, you are fighting a vain battle. We have to go to the root of the problem. We have to, to deal with the root of the tree, which is we need to have a changed heart. So this, these are false views of the law, that it was intended to produce righteousness. It was intended to define sin and righteousness. We have these cliche pictures. The man is standing before judgment. And what is being used to measure him? It is 10 statements. You know, if, if somebody were to say the law in the sense that the law includes the very character of God, we could live with it. But when you put 10 commandments up there, Look here, by this standard, the Jews would pass this law. The Jews who crucified Christ would pass this law. By this standard, everybody who goes to church on Saturday, I mean, most of them, they are not outright thieves. They don't take the Lord's name in vain. They don't swear or curse. They don't have idols set up in their homes. A lot of people could pass by this standard. This is belittling God and bringing down the standard of righteousness down to the level of humanity. God's standard of righteousness is much higher than this. Um, if you look at what it says in um, Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will raise up unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. It's talking about the reign of Jesus, right? In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. This is antitypical Israel. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord of our righteousness. This is where we find righteousness, brothers and sisters. It is not found in the law. In the old covenant, and people like to quote this, it says, it says, 
Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. People love to quote this. They like to point to the law as our righteousness. But this is not true when we understand true righteousness in the concept of the New Testament righteousness. In the New Testament righteousness, it is only the law who can be our righteousness because God alone is good. You cannot find it in a set of rules. You have to find God. And in this case, God through his son. You can only find righteousness when you find God. So that's the only place we can look. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Verse 21. I beg your pardon. For he hath made him to be sin for us. He made him to be cursed for us. Who knew no sin. Who was not under the curse. He was put under the curse. That we might be made. What? The righteousness of God in him. The righteousness of God is not 10 sentences, 10 paragraphs. The righteousness of God is a character and the nature of God himself. You can find this only in God. See another verse. I'm going to stop now. I know I've, I'm, I'm over my time. But see another verse, Revelation 15 and verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Thou only art holy. God alone is holy. God alone is good. You cannot find goodness. You cannot find holiness. You cannot find righteousness apart from God. So when we needed to be made righteous, God did not seek that righteousness for us through the law or in the law. He sought that righteousness in himself through his only begotten son. We are made the righteousness of God in him. So, I think I've run out of time and I'm going to stop here at this moment. And I hope, I just hope and pray that everything I've been trying to say this morning has been thoroughly understood. Because it's only as we understand in this way that we can truly understand the science and the plan of salvation. So I pause at this time before I have the closing prayer because I want to find out if there are any questions relating to what I've shared this morning. Any questions at all? Concerning the legalizing, that the law legalize the problem, I don't fully understand that. Okay, this is what I was trying to explain, Brother Steve. Um, that's why I use the illustration of the people marooned on the mountain. Now, if you jump from the mountain, what happens is that nature would kill you. If, if, you, if you live your normal life as a human being, Adam's sin condemns us. But now, when the man stands there with a gun and he says, if you jump, I will shoot you. Somebody jumps and he's shot. Why did he die? It wasn't because of nature. It was because he broke a rule. The rule says, if you jump, you will be shot. So he jumps and he's shot. So it's now breaking a law while you die. You break a legal law. Whereas before, when you jumped, you were breaking an, a law of nature. So nature was killing you. But because now jumping has been made illegal. So now if you jump, you have a penalty. So it's a legal problem now, whereas before it was a natural problem. So I'm trying to point out that before this, when a person committed sin, all he was doing was living his natural life. And we were living in alienation from God as a, as, as, a, as a reality of nature. The nature that we inherited from Adam put us in this position, but now God gave us a law. And now if you break the law, you will be sentenced to die as a legal process. Whereas before it was, it was simply a, a process of nature. Does that make it any, any, any clearer, Brother Steve? Thank you very much. Clear as crystal. <laughs> I'm grateful, Brother Steve. All right, so um, let's have the closing prayer. 